the military part of the civil war was over, parliament was victorious, and the king had nowhere to go. Over the next months and years, the villagers of Sibertoft and Clipston would bury the thousands of people who gave their lives at the nearby Battle of Naseby. The king surrendered himself to the Scots. The Scots handed him over to the English. He was then held in a variety of secure places until he escaped to Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight and he was finally in 1649 brought to Westminster to trial and condemned to death. Charles went to the scaffold believing it was a just retribution for his treatment of the Earl of Strafford. This painting was made during the trial. His execution took place on the 30th of January, 1649. These are the documents signed by the parliamentarians authorizing the king's execution. And so it was done. England had no king. For the first time in a thousand years, England had no king on the throne. With the military element of the conflict concluded, there was no longer any apparent need for an army, other than the forces required to go to Ireland to bring under control the extreme violence and bloodshed. But the army was owed many months worth of back pay. Parliament ordered the army to disperse, to go home, and suggested that six weeks pay would be enough. Unsurprisingly and unanimously, the officers and men of the army refused absolutely to disband until they had been paid in full. So the army, hitherto a tool under the control of Parliament, took on a life of its own along with all of the other various institutions striving for supremacy of acceptance of their particular principles, traditions and cultures. English, Welsh, Scots, Irish, Presbyterians, Church of England, Roman Catholics, Royalists, Parliamentarians, Republicans, Puritans. To this list of overlapping self-interested groups was added another determined and all-powerful organization, Cromwell's Ironside Army. But it was Cromwell's reputation and influence both within the military and within the political sphere which brought him to a position of prominence and absolute power and a decade which produced a tyranny which was even worse than anything that Charles I had ever intended or even contemplated. The army under Cromwell crushed all opposition. All opposition. From within the army, John Lilburn led the Levellers, a group who wanted the abolition of the monarchy and for Parliament to be truly representative. For the first time, one man one vote was mooted. It's arguable that Cromwell could only ever have dealt with such a melting pot of ideas by his tyrannical approach of absolute obedience and military rule. He regarded one man, one vote as far too dangerous, but nevertheless championed freedom of discussion and was keen to listen to those arguments which others wished to put to him. Under Cromwell, the door to discussion and argument was never closed until after he'd made his decision. But even his son-in-law, Henry Ireton, was excluded from the decision-making process. And Ireton died in Ireland whilst trying to quell the rebellion there in 1650. Cromwell was offered but refused the crown. He became the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. 
His rule was law, and he subdued Ireland in a way so ruthless that it caused not just resentment, but a hatred of the government in London. What became known as the Curse of Cromwell in Ireland has distressed and distracted British politics, even to the present day. Meanwhile, in January 1651, Charles I's son, Charles II, was crowned King of Scotland and brought a Scottish army south into England in an attempt to regain his father's English crown. Cromwell's Arnsides met him at Worcester and totally crushed the Royalist forces. Charles himself hid in an oak tree at Boscobel House to escape capture and from there to safety on the continent. The Battle of Worcester saw an end of any immediate threat of a return to either Roman Catholicism or the monarchy. But the people of Clipston were still finding and burying their dead from the Battle of Naseby, and at the same time seeing the beginnings of a reign of terror by the Puritans based on fear, based on the Machiavellian principles that Thomas Cromwell had put into practice during the time of Henry VIII. Hunting for witches had become a favoured activity, and whenever any misfortune befell the village or befell an individual in the village, someone would have to be found and held responsible, usually an elderly, single, terrified man or more often woman who would be made to pay a terrible price. During these years of national cultural reappraisal, England was an unhappy place. The destruction and atrocities that were perpetrated in the name of God by the Puritans during the Commonwealth need not be described in detail. Suffice it to say that all forms of joy, of colour, of fun, pleasure and enjoyment were driven underground, were outlawed. And the time came when the people of England began to demand a restoration of their old way of life. Cromwell's problem, which was never solved in his lifetime, was to effect a reconciliation between Parliament and the army. Cromwell died on the 3rd of September, 1658. His legacy was as a representative of dictatorship and military rule. But look a little deeper, and he's shown to be not only against the ambitions of generals, but also against the unimaginable forms of repression which the Ironside veterans he had formed and disciplined used so freely and effectively throughout the Commonwealth period. With all his faults and failures, he was a Lord Protector of the enduring rights of the old England he loved against the terrible weapon which he and Parliament had forged to assert them. After Cromwell's death, Parliament made every effort to reassert its authority over the country, over the army, and over all the political decisions that needed to be made. But it was a process which had to be re-established. And the man who finally did that, in conjunction with Edward Hyde, who had been with Charles II in exile, was one of the generals who had fought in the Civil War, George Monk. The will of the people became clear, and the will of Parliament became clear that they wanted to restore Charles II to his rightful place as king and head of state in England, after agreeing some terms and conditions. The three men, Hyde, Monk and Charles himself, negotiated a set of agreements that became known as the Declaration of Breda, an assurance that he would uphold the Anglican Church but allow religious tolerance, a pardon for his enemies, 
and that Parliament would be the final arbiter in all difficult questions. Agreed and signed before Charles set sail to a tumultuous welcome back in England in May 1660. And the members of the army, officers and men, which the people of England had become so tired of seeing on their streets, enforcing a military rule, were absorbed back into their homes, into their towns and villages, and an enjoyment of life was able to return to England. <laughs>